Dairy, nature's perfect food. Is that really the case? Is dairy really nature's perfect food, especially for infants and children? Could there be possible downsides for infants and children, especially newborns, who consume dairy? In this video, I'm going down that rabbit hole right after this. Hi, I'm Howard of Trinity Gervic Health, where it is believed that health and wellness is a choice and not up to chance. Therefore, this channel addresses health and wellness topics and gives tips and strategies so that you can make the right choice. At the time of recording this, about two months ago, I became a father for the very first time. The delivery went great and both child and mother were in good health. The only thing was that the baby had a birth weight of around 2.34 kilos or 5.15 pounds. Despite that, both mother and child were discharged the day after. Three weeks after that, my wife and I were advised by a local pediatrician to supplement breastfeeding with infant formula to help the child to put on weight. We attempted to do that, but we quit after about two minutes of doing that. Now, why did we quit? It just didn't feel right to us. And here's why. Now, I am aware of the downsides of consuming dairy in adults, but I never really looked at what the effects of regular dairy consumption are in infants and children, especially newborns. But thank the heavens I did. Because knowing what I know now, I will never feed my child dairy ever again. Instead, this little one and any future children who we are blessed with will be fed human breast milk. And if for any reason, any remote reason that that child needs formula, that formula will be dairy free. Oh, and by the way, I will advise any of you who has an infant or a young child to take note of what I have to say because the effects of regular dairy consumption on your child's well being can be potentially grave and long lasting. Now, before I get into the reasons of why I would never ever feed my child dairy ever again, let me give you some background regarding cow's milk versus human milk. Every mammal on the face of the earth produces milk for its young. Each mammalian milk is nutritionally unique for the specific needs of its species and it's no different with cows and humans. In the book Whitewash, the disturbing truth about cow's milk and your health, Mr. Joseph Keon says this about the purpose of cow's milk. Cow's milk is designed for a baby calf to double its birth weight in 47 days, ultimately reaching a body weight of around 1,200 pounds or 1,200 pounds. Human milk is designed for human babies to double birth weight in around 180 days and triple birth weight in one year, ultimately reaching a healthy weight based on the height of the adult. Now, due to this difference in infant development, human milk and cow's milk will have entirely different characteristics and makeup. According to Mr. Keon, 5% of total calories come from protein in human milk. 
However, in Cosmic, 15% of total calories comes from proteins. As a point of reference, in rat's milk, 49% of total calories comes from protein. And rats double their birth weight in four days. Therefore, as a general rule, the faster the species offspring is required to grow, more protein is required in the milk. Another fact to note with respect to cow's milk is that dairy cows nowadays are genetically engineered to produce more milk and that dairy cows are milked throughout their pregnancies. Therefore, the milk produced has high levels of reproductive hormones and growth factors. It's the combination of higher protein levels, hormones, and growth factors in cow's milk that seems to contribute to a lot of the health issues in adults and the children. The adult onset ailments that seem to be linked to dairy are too numerous to mention, and I'm not going to deal with adult ailments in this video series. However, I am going to look at four ailments suffered by children in this video series, especially newborns, and show how these ailments and dairy consumption are possibly linked. This video, as you might be aware, is the first video of the aforementioned series. Both adult onset and pediatric onset ailments are covered in great detail in Mr. Keon's book. If you want to check out that book, a link will be provided in the description box below. For full disclosure purposes, it is an affiliate link meaning that if you choose to purchase the book via the link below, I receive a commission. So feel free to support the channel in this very simple way. The first reason I would not feed my child dairy is autism. Originally thought to be a form of schizophrenia, autism is the most prevalent of a range of disorders that fall under the umbrella known as autism spectrum disorders or ASD. This group includes Asperger's syndrome and pervasive development disorder not otherwise specified or PDD NOS. Autism is typically diagnosed within the first three years of life and it strikes boys three to four times more often than girls. Classical symptoms of autism includes introversion or withdrawal from communication with others, self-absorption, repetitive play, and attachment to rhythmical movements such as rocking, difficulty interpreting emotional cues and facial expressions, may also exhibit rage and self-injurious behavior. Many autistic children do not make eye contact with their parents or care providers and may cease to communicate verbally. One out of every three autistic children will also experience epileptic seizures. There are many theories about the causes of autism and it's the cause of much debate. But one theory has attracted a lot of attention and seems to have the scientific evidence to support it. This theory involves diet. Now be warned, the following theory is heavy on science, so if it's not your thing, just strap in and bear with me. Hopefully you will see the purpose of this in the end. It holds that autism begins when an ingested component of some food or other factor causes an attack on the infant's gastrointestinal tract. After the gastrointestinal tract has been damaged, partially broken down prote proteins or protein fragments called peptides are able to cross the gut and enter into the bloodstream. From the bloodstream, the peptides are able to reach 
critical cell receptors in the brain, crossing the blood-brain barrier and causing havoc. Usually, the lining of the intestine acts as a barrier to different elements entering the blood. However, recent research has shown that in some individuals, the gut wall is more permeable than usual. In these individuals, peptide, peptides are able to cross the gut wall and enter the bloodstream, ultimately reaching the brain. Now, an infant's gut is naturally more permeable than an adult's to accommodate the larger colostrum molecules that precede the mother's main milk during the breastfeeding process. However, it is theorized that something else, possibly an assault of some kind, may increase the gut's permeability further and for a longer period of time. This external factor, whether it be a virus, an inflammatory compound, or other factors such as yeast overgrowth, renders the gut abnormally permeable, thus allowing undesirable opiate peptides to enter the bloodstream in large quantities. According to this theory, these opiate peptides then initiate an allergy response, as well as interfere with the proper functioning of the central nervous system. It has been well documented for a long while that autistic children frequently suffer from gastrointestinal issues, the most common ones being chronic constipation, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Upon close examination, researchers using endoscopy and biopsies have confirmed irregularities in the intestinal mucosa, commonly referred to as leaky gut. Researchers have also confirmed that autistic children frequently have very high levels of opiate peptides in both their blood and urine. Evidence indicates that the offending opiate peptides crossing the gut wall come from none other than cow's milk and other dairy products. The other main culprit is certain grains or products that contain gluten. Certain grains such as wheat. But the most commonly studied nutritional and dietary interventions for autism and diet involve variations of gluten-free and casein-free diet. Where did that even come from? In the 80s, a team of respected Norwegian researchers reported a peculiar finding. Uh, they were comparing the urine of autistic children to the urine of normal children in hope of teasing out any differences that could lead to hints as to what the cause is. This is a urine profile which shows spikes for each of the various components. This is what normal urine comes out like with the peptides region pretty quiet. Uh, peptides are like small pieces of proteins and normally we shouldn't be peeing out much protein. But this is the urine profile from a child with autism uh, with all sorts of peptide spikes. Here's another one. This raised the question, can the pathophysiology, the dysfunction of autism, be explained by the nature of these discovered urine peptides? First, they had to answer, where do the peptides come from? They didn't know. But there was a clue. Most of the parents of autistic kids reported that they got worse when they were exposed to cow's milk. Huh. Well, there are these two proteins, gluten, a protein in wheat, and casein, a protein in milk, that break down not only into peptides, but exorphins. Exorphins are opioid peptides derived from food proteins, called exorphins because of their exogenous origin, meaning from outside of the body, and morphine-like activity, as opposed to endorphins, which are morphine-like compounds we produce inside our bodies. So maybe some of these food peptides represent like a new class of hormones. 
So is that what the kids were peeing out? Apparently so, as some of those peptides had opioid activity. As was noted from the previous clip, cow's milk contains a protein called casein that, when broken down incompletely in the digestive tract, it produces short-chain peptides with opiate-like qualities called casomorphins. This theory linking autism to opiate compounds was first postulated in 1979 by J.A. Panksepp. Like prescribed opiate drugs, casomorphins and gliadorphins have sedative, pain numbing, and even hallucinogenic properties. So that's where the name opiate peptides comes from. These opiate peptides reach the brain where they connect with opiate receptors, the same receptors targeted by morphine administered in a hospital setting or by recreational drugs such as heroin. These types of substances affect perception, cognition, emotions, mood, and behavior and disrupt normal neurotransmission. Similar effects have been observed in patients under the influence of morphine, usually after a major surgery. These perceptual and hallucinogenic effects may offer some insight into the classical behaviors of children with autism and schizophrenia because the symptoms of these two conditions are very similar. One of the most popular dietary interventions used for autism is the gluten-free casein-free diet. It is based on the opiate peptide theory mentioned earlier. By removing the main sources of opiate peptides in the diet, it can be expected to see a reduction or reversal of the hallucinogenic effects of these peptides over time. Now, while the scientific evidence available is relatively limited, there have been studies that have shown its benefit in children with autism. Also, clinical practitioners and many parents have seen success with this diet for autism. One parent who has seen a reversal in her child's autism is a parent by the name of Karen Cerusi. Karen Cerusi, the author of Unraveling the Mystery of Autism and Pervasive Developmental Disorder is quoted in the book. The difference in my son from the day we took him off dairy has been spectacular, astonishing, and unmistakable. So astonishing that by age three, he was eight months above his age in the categories of social skills, language, and motor skills. At the age of six, in first grade, he was reading at a fourth grade level. Here is a report of her story. First, years ago, we understood so little about autism that many people thought it was a form of mental retardation, and parents of autistic children were routinely told there was no hope. But things are changing. Parents of autistic children are banding together to say there is hope for their kids. Hope in the form of a diet that some parents say can make autism go away. Here is one mother's remarkable story. You don't think the water's nice and warm? No. For Karen Sarusi, this conversation is the impossible dream. And if they land on the rock. If you told her just a few years back she'd be joking around with her son, having any conversation with him at all, she might not have believed you. Karen's son, we'll call him Miles, was developing normally until the age of 15 months. Then, 10 days after his MMR, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the boy went into seizures and had to be rushed to the hospital. And that day, he changed. Now, at the time, I didn't connect it to the MMR vaccine because I thought, well, that was 10 days ago. Uh, turns out that 10 days is just about exactly the right period for a reaction to the MMR. He seemed to lose interest in just about everything. He lost interest in us and his sister. He didn't talk. 
when you said, hey, you know, make bang bang, you know, clap hands, he just looked away. Looking at the photos is extremely painful for me. It brings back the terrible memories of losing him. I almost can't believe it's the same child. There's one of him standing on the couch. He's looking up and for all the world looks like a completely lost soul. Within three months, Karen's son lost the little language he'd learned and began exhibiting other typically autistic behaviors, walking on his toes, repeating the same movement over and over for hours, dragging his forehead along the ground. When Karen heard the doctor's diagnosis, autism, she refused to take it sitting down. What I thought was, this will not happen. This absolutely will not happen to me. I am not cut out to be the parent of an autistic child. I'm not noble enough, I'm not, I'm too selfish. I want my child, I want my little boy back, and I want him to have a normal life. Karen wanted to find out the cause and treat the disease. Suspecting a milk allergy, she and her husband removed all dairy products from her son's diet. And they were astonished to find that the symptoms of autism seemed to be going away. Karen turned to the internet for some answers. And I got on and I said, could my son's autism be related or be caused by milk? Because it just seemed so far-fetched to me. And when I came back to check my mail a little while later, there were 41 letters in the box saying, yes, absolutely, there's something about dairy that makes my kid's autism worse. Karen put two and two together. My son was drinking, you know, easily 64 to, to, to 70 ounces of milk a day. He craved it. We would run out in the morning for a quart of milk and run back mid-afternoon for another one because he screamed if he didn't get it. Because she was told wheat allergies could also trigger autism, Karen immediately removed all related products from her son's diet, with results nothing short of miraculous. And by the way, she isn't the only parent who thinks this way. Many other parents have taken gluten and casein out of their children's diets and have seen tremendous results. Also, some medical practitioners have implemented gluten and casein-free diets with their autistic patients with tremendous benefits. The fact that gluten-free, casein-free diets have been around for over 20 years and are still touted by many parents and medical professionals, it says a lot. So what's my takeaway from all that I have said before? All that I have said before just reinforces this perspective that I have on dairy. Dairy is not nature's perfect food. On the contrary, there are a lot of suspicions about dairy with respect to chronic diseases in adults. Heart disease, diabetes, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and osteoporosis, just to name a few. There is no nutritional benefit in consuming dairy. Absolutely none. Actually, in my frank opinion, dairy is toxic. Dairy is a poison. So if I know a substance is toxic for my own well-being, and even more so, for the well-being of my child. Why will I be willing to give my child a substance that I know to be toxic? I have a question to ask you. Would you be willing to give your child, your newborn child, an alcoholic beverage, a lit cigarette? How about a marijuana joint? No, I hope you said that you would not. But why is that? Because it is common knowledge that the benefits of consuming alcohol, smoking cigarettes, and marijuana joints in full-grown adults are slim to none, while the downsides of exposure to these substances are very well established. And you can be sure that the downsides of exposure to these substances in infants and children is even is magnified even further, especially in newborns. Well, you can throw dairy in the same waste basket. In closing, I want to refer to a profound quote from Mr. Keon's book mentioned earlier. Remember, you don't need a doctor's prescription to stop eating a food 
that may be causing you ill health. Now, if a possible downside of dairy exposure in a newborn is autism, in my opinion, that dairy can stay right where it was found, inside the cow. In my opinion, it is not worth the risk. As I said earlier, the only milk that, I, that my child will ever be drinking is human breast milk. Well, as long as the child is under one year old. And I don't think I need a doctor's prescription to do that. So question of the day, part one. Were you ever aware of the potential link between gastrointestinal distress and autism in children? And part two, were you ever aware of the potential link between dairy and autism in children? Put your answers in the comment section below and feel free to offer any other feedback about what you just heard. Also, if you have had any benefits from removing dairy from your child's diet for any reason, including improvement in autistic symptoms, feel free to share in the comment section below. Links to the book Whitewash, The Disturbing Truth About Cow's Milk and Your Health by Joseph Keon and Unraveling the Mystery of Autism and Pervasive Developmental Disorder, A Mother's Story of Research and Recovery by Karen Surusi will be in the description box below. For full disclosure purposes, I haven't read Mrs. Cerusi's book as yet, but I plan to read it in the future based on the reviews which I've seen on Amazon and the fact that it was referenced in Mr. Keon's book. Also, both of these links will be affiliate links. In my next video, I will discuss another ailment that is suffered by children, especially babies in which dairy has been implicated. This ailment is critical because it only has one apparent symptom, and that symptom is sudden death. Also, if you got value out of this video, give it a like and subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. So until next time, be safe and be well, and remember, Health and wellness are more about choices and less about chances.